This is Cosmo Royale, telling you to get ready for Gazbot and the Big Dog Defender. Action, activate! Here we come! Hey, what's up? It's me, Gazbot, for Action Activate, and we have a special episode today because it is an interview episode, but it is not live, it is via the internet, and we are talking with someone who is most recently known as a sort of a cyber character, so it kind of makes sense. The person we're talking to, of course, is Campbell Cooley, uh, who is known for doing many, many voiceover works, as well as some face acting. Most recently, he has been Scrozzle and Beast Morphers, and if you've watched this show before, you know we've talked about him and that character quite a bit. Hey, Campbell, how you doing? Hey, it's good to be on your show. Thanks. Thank you very much. We've been talking on Twitter for a while, uh, and it's it's awesome to kind of connect face to face and see you and like hear your voice, other than coming through, uh, you know, a filter and a mask on a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's um, it's it's this is technically hmm. my first interview about being a voice actor. Really? So in a way, I kind of feel naked because it's like you know, <laughs> I, I've always I kind of hide behind my voices, and now it's like oh, it's just. I'm using my real voice for a change. You know? <laughs> but you have done acting that that used like you've you've been in person face acting that you use your normal voice sometimes, correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I started out as a, a theater actor many mm -hmm. many years ago, and then I eventually made this. I found out you couldn't make a living being a theater actor, so <laughs> I moved I moved into film acting and been doing that for over 20 years. Well, what, what, and, I'm sorry. Well, no, say, you say you started in theater. What was the first? And I'm not talking about high school or, or college or whatever. But what was the first theater job you got, and how did you get it? Um, gosh, that's hard. I, that's or so one of ago. one of the first doesn't have to literally yeah, be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was in a um, I was in an original play uh, that had been uh, written by um, someone local and a playwright. Play a playwright, yeah. So it basically, <laughs> exactly. Um, it was like it was like a local, well-known playwright, sure. and the um, the play did really well in a like a small theater, and then it, it kind of got entered into a competition and just kind of went <clears throat> from competition to competition, and it eventually ended up winning some pretty pretty big awards. Uh, so I would say that was probably my first paid job. Right, as, yeah. As, Actor. And you got that just by open auditions, or did you know somebody, or how did that work out? You know, I must have known somebody. Um, I, at that point in my life, I wasn't doing a lot of theater. I'd kind of taken a break from theater, and I was doing other stuff. And somebody must have like contacted me and said, "Oh, you know, we're having these auditions." And right. I'd I'd worked with the people before, and I said, "Yeah, sure." And it was it was kind of a small part, but it was it was probably one of the best parts in the play. Awesome. And. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, yeah, that just uh, that just worked out, and then, you know, I did a few. Um, I kind of got I, I managed to get into a few like local commercials, nothing international or anything. Right. And then, um, like I said, you know, it, it, working as a theater actor, it's it's hard to make a living. And then, uh, to cut a very very long story short, <laughs> I ended up into New Zealand. Right. And uh, tried to break into the theater scene, and that was proved just as hard. So before so, before you moved yeah. to New Zealand, were you have you, had you only done theater in the states? Yeah, it was okay. I, my my primary acting was just theater. I like I said, I'd done maybe two or three local commercials on that for TV, it. but that was about it. Yeah. So, so so really, you found more success in and not success in in the monetary sense because I mean, obviously, theater could be very yeah. fulfilling, but you've been saying how oh, you wouldn't pay the bills. So, but you went to New Zealand got into theater but that's where you found your like kind of commercial success is that fair to say yeah i um so i i moved to new zealand just starting my life over sure and um the the theater scene here is a, even smaller than in the states right and so it was it was really hard to break into it so i decided to i got a um I got a, a, a film agent mm -hmm. and within a matter of months, I was getting auditions for films and TV and everything. And uh, not long after that, I started getting, you know, getting work. And really, I've, as you said, I've, I've done kind of more, <laughs> have been more successful as a, as a commercial actor as opposed to a theater actor. Right. And then, you know, Maybe I'll go back to theater one day. You know, I do. It is my first love, but uh, for now I, I have bills to pay. Is it hard to uh, do both at the same time? 
Sorry, what? Is it hard to do, like, if you if you have a job, whether as a, a voice role or, or whatever, you know, paying, like, quote, paying job, would it be difficult to also be doing a play at the same time, like, scheduling-wise? Oh, like, could yeah. you do that, or, yeah, no? It's, it's tough. It's really okay. tough. I do know of examples of people that, um, you know, they were offered, um, they took, a like, a, a part in a play, mm -hmm. and then maybe, like, a week before the show opens, they're offered, a, like, a $30,000 commercial, and it's just like... Right. And what do I do? And, you know, right. you, you can't suddenly leave the, the play in no. the So you, if you commit to, you know, a project, you really, you're kind of stuck doing it. Right. Um, so you're constantly in this state of flux going like, okay, you know, <clears throat> do I take this job right. knowing that I sacrificed this? And You never you want know. to turn down work, but you could be losing more work by turning it down. I, I get that. Yeah. Exactly. Which exactly. is funny too, because a lot of um, – uh, actors that are more known for, for on-camera stuff will remark how like voice acting, oh, you just walk in and walk out and I could do that in between whatever and stuff, but like no, it's still probably it's a little more involved in that is that you couldn't commit to so many things. Yeah, and there there are some voice actors who um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, in addition to doing voice acting, I also work as an ADR director in a, a smaller capacity. With, with the loop group? Or... With well, with Power Rangers okay. and uh, some other stuff, but um, there's there's the ADR director, which is like you're directing individual actors, sure. and then the loop is like oh, its own separate thing. Gotcha. But uh, we'll 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 come around to that in a second. We'll loop back. <laughs> we'll exactly we'll <laughs> loop back. Um, so, but I have seen like um, when I've when I've directed, there have been times where. Um, an actor maybe they're like working on a play or they're working on some film or something and we manage to get them for like you know an hour and maybe a right. little window of opportunity where they can break away and they come in and they they try to record but they're just so tired so it's right. it, even in that situation it's kind of it's a bit awkward to be doing you know a, a side job when you're trying to commit to this bigger project because even if you find the time to do it your your energy your emotion just isn't you don't have enough left is what you're, yeah yeah huh. yeah well, okay. Good that you're not doing that. Very honorable of you. <laughs> uh, I'm saying it like I'm joking, but I mean it. Um, I know. Well, let me uh, – branching off from that, you've done a lot of theater and stage work, and you've done a lot of voice acting, but you have done some face uh, acting. I keep saying face acting. Is that is that correct? Is that offensive? Yeah, and some... you know, it works for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. But you've done some face acting on television and commercials and stuff too, and you worked on uh, Xena and Hercules a little bit, right? Yeah, so going back to what I said earlier, when I started getting uh, my first, my first, my first uh, acting job in TV was on Xena. Okay, and the, that filmed in New Zealand, I guess. It filmed in New Zealand. I did not make that connection until just now. <laughs> a lot of people probably think it's an American show, but I mean, yeah. it is an American show. Well, because Sam Raimi, so. right? Yeah. Yeah. But um, a lot of, as as a lot of people know, um, a lot of shows get filmed overseas now because of tax incentives sure. and it's cheap. And of course, we have the, the lovely scenery here and everything. Um, so I got um, my first my first uh, job was on an episode of Xena, and I only had like three lines. Right. And but I was in I was in, I was in the episode a lot, and I oh man I don't know if I should share the story. Is, is, <laughs> is this the is this the drool episode? No 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 no, 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 no. okay. <laughs> Jewel scene. It's not the jewel okay. scene, but I just, I just remembered. So my first, my very first day right. on a set, we were on location. It was, um, it was like an external castle set. Right. And in the episode, um, Autolycus, it was an Autolycus guest episode, mm -hmm. and he had stolen this golden statue. And oh no, didn't he stolen it? Oh no, no. What happened was. <clears throat> Somebody beat him to it. There was this giant golden statue, and somebody stole it. And he was just his pride was like, "Oh my gosh, something <laughs> for me!" So he and Zena and Gabrielle go to try and get it back. Right. And the guy who uh, was is my boss in the episode. He's he's the one that's stolen it. And in the scene, this is like my, again, this is my very first day on set. Right. Very first scene. And the guy is the guy who stole it is getting ready to melt down the statue, and we're there's like a furnace behind us, right. behind us. And all they had done, I think, was like carve a door out of the side of the set or something, and then they made it look like a furnace and everything. They they ran a pipe into it um, where they could like you know 
pump the gas through and light sure. it and it have a bit of fire. So, and I'm, I'm literally standing just like a few feet away from it. So we do the, the walkthrough and everything and we're getting ready to film it. And the guy goes over and he, he, he starts the gas and he lights it up and the flames kind of start building up and everything. And then it really looked like a furnace. And it's like, wow, that's really impressive. <laughs> the flames got bigger and bigger and started licking the outside mm. of the door. And I was like, wow, that's really impressive. <laughs> somebody on a megaphone said, everyone step away from the set. The set is on fire. <laughs> and it turned out that I guess, I don't know, because the set's more or less made of cardboard and, right. and wood and sure. styrofoam and everything. So I don't know if they failed to spread some, flame retardant or something but like you know like the set is yeah. on fire and <laughs> like, okay and now we're just moving away from the, from the and we're all standing from a distance while they're running to get you know the put the fire out and i'm staring this staring at this going like wow if the set burns down they'll have to bring me back i'll get another paycheck out of this <laughs> <laughs> So that was my first day. <laughs> so you went from being the starry-eyed optimist of these are great set effects, oh my gosh, to being amazingly cynical of like I hope it burns for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, burn, burn. I want the extra paycheck. But you know, it turned out um, by the time I don't know how it happened. By the time they got the fire equipment to put it out, somehow it had burned out by itself miraculously. Right. So they ended up instead of canceling that day they just kind of like cropped the shot somehow so that they could still film and i was like ah. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> so yeah that was my my first day on a film set that's that's an exciting day though i mean it could have just been standing around doing nothing and like so yeah that's an awesome first yeah. story <laughs> um but there is another story and i deliberately and I, i've seen hercules and xena but not in years and i wasn't like i didn't see every single episode when it was on so i, I read a, an interview you had done about those shows a while back and they had talked about the infamous drool episode and i oh, didn't yeah. know what they were talking about and i deliberately didn't look it up because i wanted to hear from you what <laughs> okay so um <clears throat> Um, you know, there was, uh, it was an interesting summer because, so that job I just told you about was my very, very first film acting gig. Right. And then miraculously, like over the next six weeks, I got cast in like several other Xena episodes. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And I mean, I got, I got quite spoiled. I was thinking, you know, Hey, <laughs> when are they going to call again? <laughs> but uh, one and, of the gigs was And to be clear, for, these were different characters each time? Different characters, yes, gotcha. yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, I got cast uh, in an episode. It was like it was like the comedy episode mm -hmm. of the season, and it was very much uh, very kind of Monty Python esque inspired comedy. Gotcha. And there was this one scene where uh, Zena and Gabrielle are they're they're quite sick. They've ca they've caught a, a bug and they're just violently ill. And Zena has offered Gabrielle something to help her with uh, how she's feeling. And what Gabrielle has done is she's taken it orally and she was actually supposed to like apply it to her oh. skin. <laughs> and she's lost all control over her now. Gotcha. So, so they're sleeping and I come into the scene in the middle of the night to assassinate them. Gotcha. And, uh, Long story short, Xena kind of knows I'm coming, and she knocks me down. We have a tussle on the ground, and then she does the, you know, the, yeah, yeah. The, the thing. And I'm laying there completely immobilized, and she's trying to interrogate me. And then all of a sudden, oh, she, diarrhea. And she like she says to Gabrielle, says, I, I did the pinch. Just, I got to go. You, you interrogate me. <laughs> and Gabrielle kind of wakes up, and she's leaning over me oh. in her bed on the floor. And she proceeded to just drill all over my face, and <clears throat> the a lot of a lot of fans, a lot of Xena fans, have gotten back to me and said, like, you know, oh my gosh, that was the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. Right. And the the thing I I kind of don't want to admit to is that I think the reason it's so funny is that I'm not acting in the scene. The the look on my face that was not acting. That was <laughs> sheer horror because I was. I was waiting for this goop, like, oh, I don't want it to drop in my mouth. Please don't drop my, don't, don't, don't go up my nose. Oh. <laughs> and so and it what, is, was it actually the actress drooling or was there some no, sort of special effect? 
they put um they put some kind of glucose into her mouth. Okay. So it like so so it would look like drool or something. But it was coming and out of her mouth. Onto it was you. actually coming out of her mouth. Onto okay. <laughs> and um, I think the the first I we did the first take and they yelled cut and everyone applauded. I was like, uh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Oh well, that, is, that's I'm a amazing. real actor now. You know? Yeah, well, that's method. I mean, that's there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't look that up because it was much more entertaining to hear you tell it. <laughs> I got one person who wrote me said that when she was eating a hamburger when she watched the scene, and the moment the goop hit my face, she laughed so hard she spit the hamburger out of her mouth. If there was someone else there, it'd be like almost there in the scene too, because now they're getting spit on as well. <laughs> it's like 4d entertainment yeah so so this is how i started my career with you know fire fire and, and <laughs> <you know. laughs> could have been worse could have been better but you know <laughs> at least it's interesting right yeah i got a i got a lot of really cool stories to tell awesome well uh, tell me this story um you start off doing theater and you uh, were getting camera work doing uh, face work doing commercials and things like that in xena um and it seems like at some point you started doing more and more voice work to the point where that's right. more what you do now uh how did that change happen like how and why did that change happen was it a choice was it coincidence what how'd that happen good question good question so um <clears throat> Anybody who's like worked as an actor will admit that uh, they can. They kind of have to admit that, unless they're really, really fortunate, you you can't re you can't really make a living as an actor. You have to have side gigs as well. Sure. And so, the natural thing for me was, you know, I a lot of people had said to me over the years, "Oh, you have a nice voice. You should try and do voice work." So. That was kind of like my logical take on it. I thought, okay, sure. you know, I'm not, I'm not working consistently, so why don't I get a voice agent? And I, I struggled getting a voice agent. Um, I don't, I don't really know why. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I just didn't try hard enough. Mm -hmm. But so I, you know, I, I guess I got sidetracked and I was more focused on, on acting and everything, but I had tried to, you know, break into the voice industry. But it seems like the voice at the time, at least, wasn't something you felt passionate about. You were like, oh, I should do that for my career. So maybe that's why you didn't try as hard because you were more invested in the other things. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> possibly. Um, but I, the other thing is that because it's we're such a – New Zealand is such a smaller market, mm -hmm. there's less voice work. And the other thing that, that complicates matters is that um, – 90% of the voice work in this country is actually done by 10 people, mm. which right. means that the remaining 90% of the voice work is being fought over by, you know, hundreds of potential voice actors. Right. So, so when I say that, like the 10 people are doing, uh, 10, I'm told three things, <laughs> 10, uh, <clears throat> these 10 people, like they're doing like all the major brands, like, you know, the, the voices for the banks and the grocery right. stores, that sort of thing. Um, and there's not there's not heaps of character voices in you know voice work in this country, so I um uh I like so I said I kind of I got sidetracked and I forgot about you know trying to get a voice agent and a few years went by, and there the the ADR director at the time for for Power Rangers he uh he was only going to like uh voice agents to try and get uh, voice actors for the show right well for some strange reason he decided to expand he throw throw a wider net and he contacted um my acting agent at the time he said do you have any american voice actors on the show uh, not voice actors do you have any american actors on your on your books yeah and my agent went, yeah yeah sure we got this guy and they put me forward and i got the audition and I was just like, I was like, oh, I have to have this. <laughs> it was, he was, uh, they were casting um, SBD at the time. Right. So I, um, I, I got the audition and I went in there and I was just, I was, I was terrified. I was, I'm, I don't like admitting that, but right. I was absolutely terrified. Let me, let me interrupt uh, for one second. Were you uh, nervous, terrified, all that? because uh you just needed a job and you wanted to break into this industry or was it because it was power rangers and you knew the franchise like what what was the where was it coming from right. 
Good question. Um, it wasn't because it was Power Rangers. Mm -hmm. I think it was just because these auditions are so hard to get. Gotcha. I knew this was going to be my one shot. Okay. Fair. And um, fortunately, you know, I mean, the the ADR director, he was lovely. He was he was really he was really gentle. He was very relaxed. And uh, I mean, I mean, I've had some I've had some voice auditions where it's just like, oh man, <laughs> it's just it's soul destroying. Like you leave the you're just like, oh, I'm never going to work in the industry again, you know. <laughs> but, so I go in, and uh, I remember I was so I'm going to do a visual here. Okay. <laughs> flip chart here so let's say this is like the stand right uh, that they close the sheet on the music stand i was so terrified i was clinging to the <laughs> side <laughs> the whole audition i just i couldn't let go i was like <sighs> <laughs> i'm surprised so, you didn't like make noise on the mic by shaking it or something yeah yeah <laughs> so i did the um i did the audition and um, they, I, I saw what the character looked like. It was, it was a character called Tomars. Right. And he, he's kind of like, in my mind, he kind of looked like this cat, but like with scales. And he had this big toothy grin, you know? So I thought, I kind of, kind of reminds me of the Cheshire cat from oh, Alice in Wonderland. So, so I kind of did this, you know, Cheshire cat voice and everything. <laughs> and I, I didn't think it was going to sell. And then I, I got the part awesome. and I was quite thrilled. And I uh, went in to do the thing, and of course, you know, did my <laughs> the, the whole audition. <laughs> and um, a few years later, the ADR director um, admitted to me. He said that I mean, he, he gave me this. Um, I hate I hate sharing this because it sounds very self congratulatory. But um, if, if it's true, it's true. You know, I mean. <laughs> He said he said that um, it's ex he said that it, it was extremely rare that people coming into audition for Power Rangers would get cast on their first try. Mm. So that meant a lot to me. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So that's kind of how I got uh, roped into uh, Power Rangers. Oh, and and the the consequence of that was because I had done a voice job, I had no trouble getting a voice agent right that's that seems to be how it works in a lot of industry of like you can't get a job until you get a job and now everybody wants you to do the job it's like where right. were you the rest of my life <laughs> uh well let me ask you then so this got that was your foot in the door not just with voice acting but power rangers specifically and yeah. uh i am not you know it, it's funny i always talk about myself like depending on who i'm talking to i'm either a power rangers expert mega fan or i'm kind of a casual fan because it's such a spectrum you know like when i when we're doing our show people routine school me on stuff I don't know but you know I feel like I know a lot but going through uh I was looking at your IMDB and Wikipedia and, and Rangerpedia trying to see exactly what voice you do because I knew you did Scrozzle, I knew you did Snide I knew you did Cosmo and um uh what was the general from Megaforce the moth guy I'm, I'm blanking on his oh, name oh uh Malcor Malcor so I knew you did those four for sure and I'm like and a bunch of others that I didn't really know and so I went through and looked um but I found some of the details didn't quite match up and um so, for example, on Wikipedia, it said that you started in 2007 when you did Alpha 6 for Operation Overdrive, but you just said you started no. with SPD. So, no, well, Wik Ranger Wikipedia, Ranger Wiki, I should say, basically says you started with Tomars, which you just confirmed on SPD, and it right. seems like you had at least one part on every season until the current season. Is that the correct? Correct. Okay, so that's the correct thing. So, yeah, Wikipedia yeah. is not your go to place for your know, accuracy. But, but apparently Rangerpedia is, at least for Rangerpedia. you. Rangerpedia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plug. So uh, so they liked you and they, they said it was rare for you to get cast the first time. How did it go that you I, you like again, you've been on every season since then and I don't know how many actors have, but very few I'm imagining. Um how what was it that they were just so impressed by that first audition. Was it that you're easy to work with? Was it that you're versatile? Like, like, and it's hard to self-examine, I realize. But why do you yeah. think you've got called back so much? And with being said, I like your work. I understand why. But, like, you know, from your point of view, it, sometimes it's more than just being good. So how do you think? Right. Yeah. No, I, I don't think there's one specific answer. I'm sure it's a, it's a combination of things. Right. Uh, I, I do think on a certain level part of it is um, – being easy to work with mm -hmm. and i think i'm i think i'm relatively easy to work with um having been on the other side you know on the the directing side right um 
yeah, oh, there's just some people that are very difficult to work with. <laughs> <laughs> like my my patience has been tested on several occasions. <laughs> but uh, I think I, I think I'm fairly easy to work with, and I think the other thing is that um, I'm going to digress here slightly. So digress away. I digress away. I'm going to give you a one, one shot. Of, there you go. <laughs> one of the um, one of the things that resulted from getting cast that first time was um, at the same time there was somebody in another uh, recording booth um, in the same building, and right. they were recording what's called loop. Mm-hmm. And looping is like all the background sounds. So like if you have um, people in like you got two actors and they're talking in a, a diner or something you've got to record all those people in the background, you know, mm-hmm. who are eating and right. stuff. You may not understand what they're saying, but you, you still have to hear them. A lot of and peas then, and carrots, peas and carrots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's the um, the foot soldiers like uh, Vivix and Tronics and all that kind of stuff. So right. those those have to be voiced as well. And uh, I had gone in to record for Rangers and um, somebody had just not shown up for Loop and they needed it. They needed an extra person, so they contacted uh, the guy who was directing me, and he said, oh, I've got this guy. He's really good, and literally I finished that job, went and got a sandwich, came back, and started looping, and so I've been looping for the show ever since as well, so I've literally That's looped awesome. That's just, so about, good. just about every episode since SPD. That's so great, and, and uh, like you were very lucky right there, but I think very it's a- lucky. But I think it's important to point out that I always feel like luck is when uh, preparation – or success is when preparation meets luck. Because if you hadn't been working, hadn't been training, hadn't already you know, won that one audition and been on that set, the fact that somebody didn't show up wouldn't matter. Like You put yourself in a position to succeed, and then when the lucky break happened, you got it. So that's – I just want to give you cre- – even though it was lucky, you should get credit. Thank you. So um... – now, so I think uh, what I was trying to answer was, um, <clears throat> so well, like, what's what was like the credit of you know, how how they kept bringing me back, bringing me back. Right. Um, so I um, I am digressing digressing slightly with the loop story, but um, I'll, I just want to focus on one element there. Sure. So when I got into the, the loop group, um, you know, I was just kind of like watching everybody, trying to get a sense of okay, how does this work? You know, what's expected. And there was this one guy, a guy named Jeremy, and I just watched him for like the first the first season that I was working on it. And the thing I learned from Jeremy was don't hold back. You've got to give 150 percent. And so that's what I did, even at the expense of, you know, my, my throat sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the people that like were only giving 50 percent, uh, you know, they didn't get asked back. So that was a great learning curve there mm. and then i think the other secret of um secret of the success is i mean this is and i could be i could be wrong on this point this is just my personal interpretation sure. that whenever i've gone in to do a voice i try to do something completely different so that it's like if you listened to all the voices together right. you wouldn't hear any kind of bleed over right and i think i think with a few of the characters there's a little bit of bleed over but for the most part i try to keep each voice distinct and unique and i think that that's probably why i keep getting asked back that's awesome and that makes sense it's actually odd to me that other actors wouldn't do that like because that just seems like like uh, i don't want to belittle your accomplishment but that seems like the obvious choice that you want to make these individuals be individuals right. and i guess you just had that thought and a lot of other people like ah, it's a monster who cares kind of whereas you took it a little more seriously well you know and, and maybe maybe i'm over analyzing you know maybe uh maybe there are people that can just only do maybe one or two voices and you know what that's great mm-hmm. you know those voices will be good for certain kinds of monsters and characters right um so, you know, I'm not, not trying to take away from anybody's, you know, ability or anything, gotcha. but I do really, I, tr- I try really hard to make them uh, very distinct. And that's probably why, <laughs> that's probably why I ended up getting uh, snide because when I, when the time came to audition for snide, I was like, I reached into my little bag of tricks and I was like, oh my, I have nothing here. I had a <laughs> character and um, I just ended up 
just pushing my voice harder than I had ever pushed it before just to come up with something horrible because he just, he, <laughs> he looks like a psychopath. Right. And I really, I wasn't expecting to get it. I just wanted the audition to go well. Mm. And when I got the part, then I was like, how am I going to sustain this? <laughs> and how did you sustain it? Cause obviously you did it and it was a, an awesome character and it lasted a while and you did it. So how did that, how did you do it? I would say a, a lot of lozenges and a lot of hot drinks. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> There were probably there might have been a few recording sessions where maybe I didn't get through, oh, really? and we had to come back and like finish it on an, you know maybe two or three days later after my voice recovered. But right. with Snide, I, I like I do like the way he sounds, mm -hmm. um, but man, no one will ever appreciate how much <laughs> my voice. I do a Snide session and literally like <laughs> it's like I, w I wouldn't be able to talk for a day or two. I feel bad because I'm laughing. You're like, darkly humorous. But um, the, you know, of course, my biggest concern is like, am I doing any kind of long term damage? And right. like, oh, it's for the fans. It's important. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> so uh, if they ever call you back to reprise a role you've done in the past, you kind of hope it won't be snide. In a weird way, like in not a weird way. Yeah, yeah, not that you don't like that character, not that you're not proud of the work, but like it would be the hardest character to have to come back and do. Yeah, uh, definitely. Right, definitely. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was saying, well, uh, it's kind of a, another little side tangent. I don't think I actually, uh, but talking about all the characters you did, um, specifically in Power Rangers, not in, in everything. What would you say would be your favorite, um, in terms of not. Uh, in terms of that you're most proud of on the screen, like regardless of how easy or difficult or whatever, like the process going, but when you were done and that character's out there, which one were you happiest with? Which one, like if you were going to show somebody one character you did on Power Rangers, which one would it be? Gosh. I, I think it would be a tie mm -hmm. between Snide or Cosmo. Really? I really thought yeah, Scrozzle because... would be in there. Um... You know, Scrozzle is growing on me, mm -hmm. but um, no, the, I think Cosmo just because he's his the voice the voices are just at such opposite right. ends of the spec. Gotcha, fair. And they were and both, Cosmo, and they're both what? Uh, they're both like main characters over an extended period of time, but so different. Like not just in the voice, but the actual characters themselves too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know what I was saying. I don't care. I'm just excited to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Uh, and, and I – have you done any – I don't think it has happened yet, but but maybe I'm just not thinking of it. Have you done any episodes – it doesn't even have to be Power Rangers, but where you did multiple characters that interacted with each other in that same episode that you're aware of? I mean maybe uh, you did a background character that like you didn't realize, but – Well, okay. I have done – like during um... – <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. This is the damage doing Snide. Um, <laughs> uh, I know during Dino Charge, mm -hmm. um, there were there were times where Snide would be on screen, and then you might hear the Mecha voice in the background. Oh, you know? right. Now, no. To be clear, uh, the Mecha voice. Oh, it just came up. You could see the Dino Charge Morpher Gun. You did the voice of the gun, the, the morphing gun. Uh, what is it? The Dino Charger, I guess it's just called. I'm so bad with names. <laughs> uh, but they call it the Mecha voice. So you did that as well as, uh, I guess, anytime there was some sort of power up or anything, that was all you, right? Right. And so you're saying that it might have been snide talking while the Rangers were using some sort of morphing ability and there'd be overlap. Yeah, I, I, know in, I know in Snide's final scene before they destroyed him mm -hmm. that, uh, like, He's he's talking to them, and then they do their power up and everything, and you hear the voice. And right. you know, I, I've watched the scene once or twice, and it's really disconcerting. It's like that's kind of what I was getting at. Like it's sort of got to be cool but weird at the same time. Yeah, because everyone else, especially like kids or people that you know don't understand that haven't talked to you or voice actors, they're not thinking about it. It's like it's a character, it's a piece of weaponry, whatever. Uh, but but yeah, to you, it's like you you can't forget that that's you. I'm imagining like you definitely hear yeah. your own voice, and it's yeah. So yeah. That's that's got to be yeah fun in a weird way. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's altogether ooky. Hey, 
You're in some kind of Adams family over here. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, since you talked about doing the Mecca voice, which I, I was saying before we started, I didn't realize that until I was doing my research. And, like, it's very iconic. In some ways, it's more iconic than a lot of the villain voices because yeah. it's played constantly every episode in multiple ways and stuff. And it's like, you know, the kids who want to pretend to be Power Rangers, they're they're doing that, you know. Um did they use your voice or did you re-record your voice for the actual toys that kids would buy or was no. that really that was they 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 hired somebody in LA okay. to do the voice for the the toy right and then um when they were they actually they actually they did recorded the voice for the toy mm-hmm. before they cast me as the mecha voice Oh, weird. I said, now, why do you yeah. think they did that? Like, because essentially, I understand when they have, like, uh, you know, a big movie with Chris Evans as Captain America, and he's not going to come in and do the toy voice, so they get somebody else. But if, if you're a voice actor, and I'm not saying you're not as big as Chris Evans, because clearly you are, but, <laughs> no, but the, you're a professional voice actor, they have a professional voice actor in L.A., why wouldn't they have one of you do all of it? Why break it up that well, way? I, I don't know. I'm just, and My educated guess would be, they needed to have the toys ready to sell as mm. soon as the show went to air. So they probably did that first. And then, um, you know, by the time that, that, that had all been manufactured and everything, we were now in production for sure. the show. All right. That's a, that's a pretty good answer. I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I, would, I would have loved to have done the voice for the toy. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, you know, these things happen. Well, uh, speaking of toys, um, when you did Dino Charge, they made a Snide figure because he was like the big bad. So, of course, he's going to get a figure. Uh, I, I don't think – have you ever got any other figures, whether in Power Rangers or Hercules or whatever? Is, is Snide potentially – I mean, and don't get me wrong. Having one figure is amazing. I'm just wondering if there are any others out there that, that you know of. I think – I think there's a Ripcon figure. You're absolutely right. There is a Ripcon figure. There's actually, I think there's two because there was like the color variant that he changed at some point. Well, in the, I think in the original Sentai, right. there was a, like a pink version <laughs> or, a, or some other color version. Yeah. And then they just used the whatever color variation for um, Ninja Steel. Right. Just, so um, I've never seen that toy. But I, I'm just, of course, I'm kicking myself now that I never got a Snide action figure when they were available. I've since gone online to find them, and it's just like they're selling for like how much? How, oh, oh, really? Man. I have one. I didn't even know. I've, I've just been sitting on a gold mine without realizing it. Yeah. Um, but yes, I'm looking right now. Actually, I can share my screen real quick so that, uh, people can see. Uh, this is the Ripcon figure. You won't be able to see it, but the people watching will. Uh, and it does look like it's the blue version. But I was right. There is a blue version and a red version. So there's red. two versions of, of your character were made. So there's so you have three figures then. Because there's the, the blue and the red Ripcon as well as Snide. And, I, and it doesn't really count, but I suppose you could argue the the Dino Charge Morpher. Oh, yeah, true. Uh, well, although it's not really you. Yeah, it's not really. We can you know? pretend. We can pretend. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, so that's – I'm glad I asked that because I, I didn't even think about it. But, yeah, you got three, so that's great. Um, let me see what else. Well, sticking with Power Rangers for a little bit, uh, you do mostly villains, um, and, and villains can be fun. A lot of actors say villains are more fun than heroes and stuff. That being said, yeah. uh, would you want to do a, a heroic voice or even a part? You know, uh, I mean, obviously you couldn't be a ranger, but like as a mentor or uh, something like that, would you be interested mm-hmm. – if you were given the choice, the next role you're going to be given, and they said, "Hey, you could do this hero or this villain," would you take the hero just for something different? You think, or absolutely okay. <laughs> I would love for you to be a hero or a mentor or you know some kind of you know good guy for a right. change. Um, <clears throat> do you ever uh, express this to the people casting you, or you're just happy you don't want to rock the boat? You know, I, I, I suppose it's never really come up. It's mm-hmm. just like you know, any work I can get, that's great. Sure. Um, sure. I think it, was, it wasn't It was until after um, I did one episode as Alpha 6. I was like, wow, that was really nice. Right. And that was that was Operation Overdrive, right? So that was early on. Correct. And, yeah, I, I didn't even realize that was – well, yeah, I have – Operation Overdrive is one of the seasons I haven't finished for those uh, that follow. <laughs> it is – it is my partner's favorite uh, season. Uh, actually, Operation Overdrive is my favorite right here season. So everyone knows what's going on. Um, but uh, how was that? that that's got to be weird because you're following, I think there had been, what, three voice actors for Alpha at that point? There's Alpha 5 and yeah. 6. and So how yes, did you 
did they tell you what version to do or did they said do your own thing or did you look at what other people did? Um, so, uh, it was a fluke, uh, you know, oh man, I was saving this story for a convention if I ever get invited to a convention, but you know what? I might as well share it now. Well, I mean, I want to hear it, but I don't want you to not have a cool thing to tell later. Oh man. It, it, it does, it does directly tie in with alpha. All right. You know what? I'll save it for a convention. Okay. Well, how about this? Uh, you don't have any conventions lined up currently that you're advertising, right? No, no, none that I can talk about. You don't, no, I'm saying you may have booked some, but none that you can talk about. But we know that there is a uh, Ranger Stop and Pop coming up, and we know that there's Power Morphicon Prime coming up. So if you were going to be at a convention, it might be one of those two. And if you ended up at one of those, people might want to go see you to hear an alpha story. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. All right. But um, so, uh, so I won't. Okay. So I won't share. I won't share that particular alpha okay. story. But I'll, I'll obviously I'll answer your question about how I got the the part. So, um, <clears throat> so my uh, my voice agent just she just contacted me and she said, "Oh, look, you know they're bringing back this character from uh, Power Rangers," and I have no idea why she put me forward because right. there was I don't think there was anything on my show reel to suggest that I could do <laughs> right an, an alpha voice. Um, but she sent it to me anyway, and she, she my my voice agent throws me all these curveballs. Can you do this? Can you do this? And, you know, right. and and I think most of the time I can accommodate her, but there are a few times where I'm less like, hmm, <laughs> I will we'll give that a try. But so they um they were looking for a voice to uh for this guest spot uh, with bringing back Alpha and Operation Overdrive, and they sent me a link to. Um, I think it was, it might've been the original voice okay. because memory serves the alpha six voice had kind of more of a New York. They changed uh, it. Like it was, it, it, it had the New York accent and, but it also had a more of a female sounding voice too. Like it was alpha six had two very, very different voices, both of which were different than the original one. So they, the, the link that they sent me was more to, I think the first voice. Right. So, um, so I, I listened to it and I said, and I knew instantly, I said, yeah, I can do that. Gotcha. And, and I went in and, and I got it. Right. And uh, I was, you know, to, again, it was like at the time, it was just a job. And then later I was like, oh man, that was actually, that was really, that was really cool. It was right. nice. To, it was nice to be a hero for a change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then never so, again. <laughs> and then, and it's not like, yeah, I'm like, oh man, I want to do half this. Come on. Uh, it's yeah. not going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, who knows? Yeah, maybe they'll bring Alpha back in the future. Yeah, or maybe you'll get. Like, I mean, there are other roles like Keeper and characters like that. Maybe you'll get one of those, you know, coming up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? I would really love to do. <clears throat> My dream would be to do um, like a non-human Power Ranger, like Xenowing. Right. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, or like a Phantom Ranger or somebody like that. Yeah. Well, if they do, um, well, they announced the next season is going to be an, an adaptation of Ryu Soldier, but there's. Uh, the other season, Q Ranger, that has like 13 Rangers, and many of them are non-humans. If they ever adapt that, they're definitely going to need some voice actors to, to bring them to life. So, you know, keep yeah. that in mind. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so we've been talking about, a lot about the voice acting. Do you, at this point now, not talking about where you started, but where you're at now in your career, do you yeah. have more of a preference for voice acting or for on camera or theater? Like if, if we could wave a wand and that could be your career, not worrying about money and stuff, like one of those three would be what you do. Do you have right. a preference? You know, it's funny you say that uh, because I never thought I'd get to this point in my career, but I would probably just be happy doing voice acting from now on. That's great. I, I like, I didn't, I kind of didn't expect that, but that's awesome because that means you're kind of doing what you want to do. Well, I, and I think part of it is, I mean, there's, there's, there's several reasons, but I think one of the reasons is that I'm, yeah, you know, I'm a really, I'm a really private person. Um, and that's I'm why very, you got I'm, into acting. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm very, and I'm very introverted, which is just like, you know, how did I end up being an actor? But I'm very introverted and and, no, and I've had people ask me over the years to do interviews, and I'm like, mm. well, I once again, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and doing this. Uh, hey, 
it's a, honestly, it's a privilege. It's such a privilege to be able to be interviewed by you. But I, over like the last 20 years, you know, I've had people approach me and say, oh, can we interview you? And 99% of the time I've been like, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> right. And then occasionally I, I've done it. But, um, oh my gosh, I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> um, introvert. Oh, voice acting. You were, you've reached the point now where you, you would choose to do voice acting. Oh, yeah. Right. So, um, so my guess is if I could, if I could just be a voice actor for the rest of my life, mm-hmm. it would satisfy that creative side of me, but at the same time still kind of help me maintain that kind of behind the scenes, you know, right. Sort of the, not in the limelight and, you know, and don't get me wrong. I mean, the, I'm glad for the stuff that I've done on screen, mm-hmm. uh, the face acting <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'd love to do some more. I'm right. sure I will do some more, but I, I really have grown to love the voice acting right. and, uh, and a, a nice bonus is that you don't have to memorize the lines. True. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and I guess it's a very specific kind of fame, too, that even the most famous voice actors in the world could basically walk anywhere, do anything they want, and no one's going to stop them. But if they go to like a comic convention or something, then they're superstars. So you could kind of choose when you want to be famous in a way. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's that. That is that's very much. Oh, my gosh. I, I can't believe I'm going to share this. Um, I, I liken myself. I have the soul of a dog, but I have the temperament of Okay. Oh, but I have the temperament of a cat. Okay. Soul of a dog, temperament of a cat. So it's kind of like you know, I need, I need, I need interaction. Love me, love me. Love. Okay, go away, go away, right. go away. <laughs> love me when I want on my terms that might change at any yeah, moment. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but I have the soul of a dog. You know, <laughs> if, if they can get through the the difficult way to pet you properly, then you're their friend forever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so we've been going for a little while, so let me see how many questions I got left here. Um, well, okay. Let's do, them all. Let's do them all. Okay, all right, we'll do them all. All right, so uh, if they asked you back for the next season after Beast Morphers, which we don't know what it's called. Everyone's saying it's going to be Dino Knight, but it's Ryu Soldier. Uh, if they ask you back, will you go back? I understand you can't say if they have or not, but. Absolutely. Okay, no no reservations, no caveats, just I'm ready to. No, no so... caveats, no reservations. I would love to do some voice work for next season, okay. but. And while I tell you, since they since they announced that Rio Soldier is going to be the next incarnation, right. um, I'm really I'm so touched by all the people on social media that have reached out to me and said like, oh my gosh, you know, you should do this character, and we'd love for you to do this. And yeah. yeah. And it's like you know what, and I would love to as well, <laughs> but I mean, I don't even have a guarantee that I'll get an audition. Right. So you know. I don't want people to get their hopes up. No. Well, there's a precedent down. set that you've been on every season for a while and you're kind of an institution. Not that that means you, I understand you're not guaranteed, but it would kind of be in their best interest to, to keep you there. You know what I mean? Like just to keep the fans happy, if nothing else. Well, you know, and that's, yeah, I don't, yeah. personally, I don't think I'm that important, but yeah, <laughs> you know, if, at, at this stage, the only reason I would want to do anything is that I would just be crushed if, if you know, if the fans had an expectation, and then like, I don't even do anything next season. Right, right. Well, so that's that's, well, that's we, my own. We understand it wouldn't be your fault if if it didn't happen, and we also understand that you can't tell us until it's on the air, so we have no idea if they what is going on. But we hope that something will come through. I guess is, <laughs> there's you. that. I do too. <laughs> um. So, well, okay. I'm gonna ask you a question that you can't answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Uh, okay. th- this wasn't on the list I sent before, but um. So Scrozzle was destroyed at the end of last season. Uh, he, he, he outlived Evox, but not by much. And then we saw – I haven't watched – today's Saturday in the U.S. I haven't watched today's episodes. I've only seen the first episode. And it starts with Scrozzle being back, and he's being his old self. He's harvesting more effects, and he's got a drill tron. It's very – you know, there is no explanation how or why that happened. That might come later. I feel like the answer is going to be no, but can you tell us – how and why we see Scrozzle again after last time we saw him be destroyed? Or do we have to just wait and see? You know, um... Oh, if you man. can't answer, I understand. But I have to ask. Um, I can't... I can't really answer. Fair. Um, but, I mean, even, even if there is some kind of um, explanation later... Sure. 
my my personal feeling is we don't necessarily need an explanation because it's already been established is that he's got that instant teleporter. So, you know, uh, okay. So the moment that that thing was going down, he could have just boom, I'm out of here. So that's your theory. That's your, what they call in the Phantom, the head cannon, where it's never actually happened. But as far as you're concerned, he survived by using a teleporter. That would, that's, that's I'll, my head. Cannon. I'll buy that. Yeah, I'll buy that. That'll be my head cannon as well. So maybe we get another explanation, but you, you've successfully explained how he could survive even if they never do. So I like that. Thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, and, and he's, yeah. a, he's a survivor. I mean, he has that survived. So I would, I'd be cannon. interested. Um, they do a lot of, they're doing the comics now and it's mostly Mighty Morphin, but they've been doing more and more. They have a time force one coming out. They did the soul, the dragon. Uh, it would be interesting if they get, if they branch out enough, it would be cool to see like a prequel, like a one shot of like, where did Scrazzle come from? What's going on in the cyber dimension? Like, like, you know, what was he doing there? Because he was like, kind of, he's all set. You know, he's like, I know what I'm doing here. You know, whatever. I almost accidentally tried to impersonate the voice in front of you, which would have been a horrible mistake. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I would, I would be very interested to read like a one shot of like his backstory because he seems like there's more going on there than the average villain, which is why yeah. uh, I, you know, like, I think Snide is. <sighs> Either Snyder or Scrozzle is my favorite of yours. And Snyder is so cool and, and awesome and, and like just like a, a badass monster guy, you know. But, like, I find Scrozzle interesting. Like, I feel like there's – like I said, I want to know his backstory. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point that you make. Um, you're right. I mean, yeah, I think there's all this potential for backstory that um, I, I would – I'd like to know yeah. what was going on beforehand. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe they should do an audio book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, you know, one of those old pop-up books you know where you pull the thing and something pops up <laughs> well i'm trying to get you a job man <laughs> or, <laughs> or maybe one of those books where it's like boop turn the page then scrozzle said you know you'd like listen to a cassette or a cd or whatever <laughs> i'm trying yeah. anything with audio that you can be paid to do that's what i want to see <laughs> do it thank you thank you i need the, I need the work um yeah and i i think i think and I, I hadn't really thought of it the way you just described, but yes, he he actually is a very interesting character because there is that mysterious, oh, you know, what's his backstory? You know, where does he come from? What's and he's sort of working for Evox, but he's not the usual minion of like, oh yeah, I'm totally on board with your plan. He's sort of like like you said, a survivor where he's like, well, I guess I got to work for this guy, and he's not really loyal to Blaze or Roxy, except sometimes he kind of helps him if he thinks it'll help himself. And like, yeah, so like, yeah. where did that guy come from? What was going on before? Like, I, I don't know. That always interests me, and we might never know, but makes him a more interesting character than just I'm a monster that works for the bigger monster. Well, I just you know, I just hope that maybe in the course of time. Um, you know, with all these awesome comics and everything that, yeah. you know, somebody yeah. gets the authorization to like build on, you know, Scrozzle's backstory or maybe, I don't know, maybe like a side story or something. Cause yeah. you know, so you there know. you go. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> uh, all right, cool, man. Well, we're on the same page about that. Uh, other getting away from power Rangers for a second. Other than power Rangers. And we've talked a lot about your other work, but just, uh, is there any role, uh, that, that you're most proud of, that you want people to know, like if, if they only know you from Power Rangers, if you were like, well, just so you know, here's one other thing I've done that I'm, I'm particularly proud of. What would that be? If, if there is something. So a, a voice outside of Power Rangers? doesn't have Rangers to be a voice, or... anything. Just whatever other piece of acting work you've done, a character, a voice on a commercial, wh uh, whatever that you're like, you know, outside of Power Rangers, this thing is, is the thing I'm most proud of. Okay, you know, I wouldn't say... The thing that comes to my mind, I don't know if it's the thing I'm most proud of because I've never, I've never really thought about my work in that capacity. It's not like I go, oh, this is my best work to date, or you know, I just, it's just work. I okay. just do it sure. and everything. <laughs> but one thing that I, I suppose, I really enjoyed doing that um, stands out in my mind is there was a um, docudrama series that came out a few years ago about Al Capone. Oh, okay and it's part of a series called making of the mob and there was a there was a first one that came out sometime before then and then this uh was kind of like the second making of the mob and this focus was on al capone and i got to play uh a hitman that worked oh. for that worked for al capone it's an actual historical figure named um alberto anzelmi and he uh had kind of like a sidekick uh whose name eludes me right now and they were sort of like the assassins that worked for um, Capone. Right. And 
uh, so I was in several episodes of that, and there's some really cool slow motion shots and everything. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> the famous, the, the famous St. Valentine's Day massacre, you know, where you take out a rival gang. Right. But um, the, um, uh, I, I suppose the moment that I love uh, to see people's reactions, there's a, uh, there's a scene where Capone hosts a dinner. Right. It's like all generals and everything. And Capone has come to believe that Alberto Anselmi and his sidekick have betrayed him. Right. And uh, basically Capone pulls out a bat and beats the guy to death at the table. Again, I'm laughing at something that's horrible. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, um, it's an amazing – I remember when we filmed it, there, it, it, was, so, it was so realistic – that i mean like the, the staging and everything like when the the guy playing capone swings the bat like in my face and then like uh, i snap back and i go down to the ground uh, to the to fall on the table and everything i could audibly hear the crew offside go <gasps> like oh my gosh <laughs> like he, like he thought he'd actually just killed me right right and it looks great on screen but it's just like and then i remember um uh, it, it got it got cut from the the scene, but really, after, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. That 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 didn't get cut. But what I'm saying is the the stuff that happened. After oh, gotcha, that. gotcha. So these guys came in and they grabbed us and they're like dragging the bodies away. And the guy that was dragging me away, he tripped over a track. So there was a track that the, the camera was rolling on, right. and he tripped right. over the track, and we both went down. And of course, you were just like. Agonizing pains, like we don't make any noise because we don't want to, you know, ruin, ruin a shot. It, yeah, and so we're just kind of laying there, and at one point we looked over and we realized the camera, the camera which you know, like was on this track, had kind of like made its way that direction. It was now coming back toward us, so oh. it, we were trying to like roll off the track and not. You know, <laughs> But the uh, the shot of me getting uh, wiped out by Capone, I'll I'll have to send you a link to it or yes, a, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty. That's that's a so that, that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, so I got to play a, a an actual historical hitman. That's awesome. That's it's you know it's yeah, funny. Uh, maybe it's a New Zealand thing, but I uh, I recently put up an interview I did with uh, James Davies, who is Dino Charge Black. And right. two things he mentioned uh, were working for the Loop Group, which I had never heard of, and now you're talking about it as well. And, and the I've other directed him in the Loop Group. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's what a connection. And like, and I did that interview with him a couple months ago, so it's weird that like we're doing these. But and then the other thing he talked about is he had been in a docudrama uh, called A Blaze, where he played uh, Colin, I forget his name, but another historical figure. So I guess the Loop Group and like historical docudramas are, are, are big in New Zealand or at least for the Power Ranger actors that I talked to because both of you brought that up <laughs> that, that's awesome cool. though that it's a, like, such a diverse thing to be able to be involved in both of those so that's really cool yeah all right so Brilliant. uh two questions left one uh what piece of what one piece of advice this is gonna be about voice acting and I'm not gonna ask you that how do you get into voice acting because everyone asked that but the, the question is what one piece of advice do you wish someone had told you when you got into voice acting? Like uh, whether it's how you got cast or how to conduct yourself or whatever, you know, the one thing that maybe you're like, oops, I made that mistake. And like, oh, if I only knew ahead of time that that would have made my life a lot easier. So for anybody that's thinking about voice acting, that is voice acting, what one thing do you wish you knew before you? You know, I don't, I don't, um, I mean, I, I, I guess I just kind of fit into it so well right? that I don't really remember there being any kind of like bumps or hiccups along the way where I went like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it right. just it, it for me, it all kind of. So your advice is be as good as you are. I mean, so <laughs> be, um, just work, work really hard. Right. Um, don't try to be don't try to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> don't. Um, don't try to impress people by being the clown or the jokester, or, you know, like, you know, constantly making jokes because that just distracts people from the work. Right. Um, just be as professional as possible. Be easy to work with. The right. people that don't get asked back are the ones that are difficult to work with. Sure. 
Um, I think that's. I thought, go ahead. I would say that's more than one piece of advice, and all good. <laughs> Uh, I thought you were going to ask me, like, uh, what uh, what bit of advice would I give to actors? Uh, well, I guess I, I, I could ask you that, and if you have an answer, I'll be happy to hear it. But I was trying to think of something that other – that would be a little bit more specific to you as opposed to more general. But if you have some actor advice you want to give out. Well, no, I don't know. that I'm, I wouldn't be saying anything profound. I think most people already know this, but, you know, maybe they just need to hear it, you know, from somebody who's, who's in the um, – in the industry right if anybody wants to be an actor make sure you know there's nothing else you can do right because this is such a hard industry it is so much harder than people realize um you know there's no guarantee of work there's no retirement plan there's no health benefits yeah um you know you're going to be eating a lot of ramen noodles um, you know, I've gone, I've gone periods where like, I think my worst period, I went over a year without work and I was living on my credit card and that was terrifying. Right. So, and then of course, you know, if you don't handle rejection well, Oh yeah. This, this is not the industry for you. I, uh, I'll, I'll talk about me for a second. Uh, <laughs> I'm primarily a visual artist, uh, as you know, and, uh, I, I often do conventions and things and I, I meet kids or parents of kids like oh they want to be an artist and blah blah, blah. and w the the bad advice i give like it's bad from a parent's point of view but it's very similar to what you're saying is like try to do something else if you can you know um but if you are d dedicated to be an artist um don't have a backup plan don't get a business degree don't do this or that make it so you have to be an artist which again parents don't want to hear that because like what no i don't like you to describe but i in my life uh, similar to what you're saying, I've gone time six months a year without getting a single job. And if I could have went and been a dentist, I would have, you know, I, 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 you know, I have, I have no heat. I don't have gas for my car. Uh, you know, if I could go work in an office as a manager, I would do that, you know, but because I had no other option, I was just like, well, I guess I'll keep drawing and hope somebody pays me next week, you know? And I feel like that's kind of what you're saying too, is like, make sure because that's, you're in for it. <laughs> I think, I think you, you just, you brought up a good point. It's like, it's not just actors. It's like basically if you're going to be an artist of any kind, yeah. whether it's a graphic artist or whatever, um, be prepared to have a hard life. Yeah. And, but you know what? It, it, I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody off following their dream or anything. No. I just don't want people to have these kind of lofty expectations of, you know, how it's going to be. Um, you know, the, when you, when you have those moments where it's working and you get that job, it's just like, oh, this is why I do it. Right. And half the time that job isn't even the one that pays well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some of my some of my favorite jobs um were like very small jobs and, and didn't even, you know, pay a lot of money. Right. They were just really satisfying jobs. Yeah. And so yeah, going back to what you said, make sure it's what you really want to do. That's excellent advice for any creative. Sure. All right, so my final question, and then I'll give you a chance to, if you want to uh, plug your social media or whatever. My final question, and I ask this of everybody. You might even know what I'm going to say. Uh, the question is, who in Power Rangers, who is the best Red Ranger? And now I normally give the caveat that wasn't on your season, because usually they'll say, oh, my, you know, whoever their Red Rangers. But you've been on so many seasons, I can't, in fairness, do that to you. So the question sure. is, who is the best Red Ranger? And you could base that on who you think was a good character, who an actor you liked, you know, a suit you like, whatever criteria you want. Who's the best Red Ranger? For me, it's probably Wes from Time Force. Okay. Do you want to? Uh... Yeah. Um, he it was just his his whole character arc. You know, he's he's uh, he's has that whole thing with his father, and then it's it's all about you know choosing to do the right thing and choosing his destiny and you know i mean that's just it just kind of resonated that's that's a great choice he is one of the most popular answers jason font who played wes people choose him as a favorite ranger often for a variety of reasons I, i've met jason font he's a nice guy a great season great arc everything you're saying is true i love the time force costumes uh but unfortunately you are wrong uh i don't know if you knew this but it is casey from jungle fury of course is the best red ranger is the correct answer so sorry about that you're not i, I... <laughs> You're not the first one to get it wrong. It, it happens. That's okay. These things happen. <laughs> uh, all right. So that's it for my questions. We've had a great talk. Is is there any upcoming appearances, shows, jobs, anything that you would like to promote of yours? Right. Um, I can't talk about anything, but I, what I can say is I'm I'm working on a few things. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Uh, I am kind of in a bit of a, a slump right now, but I am, like I said, I'm keeping busy and I'm, I've got, I've got some things in motion. So. Right. But you can't talk about, I understand how that is. So, well, do you have any social media you'd like to promote? Instagram, Facebook page, whatever. Sure. Um, I do have a Twitter account. It's mm -hmm. very simple. It's just at Campbell Cooley. Um, now I do have, uh, as a caveat, I do have a Facebook account but I don't use it. So anybody listening in, don't try to add me on Facebook because <laughs> I just don't use it. Gotcha. Uh, the best place probably to reach me right now is Twitter. Okay. And I, I have put, picked up your uh, Twitter page so everyone could see it. Uh, it's at Campbell Cooley. It's got pictures of the, the – actually the four characters that I mentioned that I knew you did from Power Rangers. Uh, and don't be fooled by the clean-shaven picture. This is the same gentleman we're speaking to today. <laughs> as, as, as I mentioned earlier in the pre-interview, um, I really don't like having a beard. But for some reason, having the beard increases my chances of getting acting work. That's so, a good reason. I mean, that's better than some people that just have a beard for no reason. You have a. <laughs> cool. All right, man. So uh, this has been really cool. I really appreciate the time. Um, and I hope to see you in the future online or maybe at a convention one day. It'll absolutely happen. And let me thank you so much for having me on your show. Honestly, it's just been such a pleasure. Thank you for being here. And uh, so I've been Gazbot. You have been. Campbell Cooley. And to the power.